right, guys, it's 630. Uh, that's almost over. Praise God. Well, my wife walks through after find out what's going on. Oh, the nursery door is locked. Okay. Oh, is someone unlocking it? I know the people watching online love this little banter going on right now. Okay. Oh, is that what it is? Okay. Yeah, we got 8,500 eggs stuffed by three this afternoon. And... So we're down to 1,500 eggs. They probably got the bulk of that done since I've been up here working with the group. So we're on schedule. We have 150 signed up children. So we did the calculations on that. 10,000 eggs divided by 150 is, I don't know. Wayne knows, he's the human calculator. 667 oh so 67 so some of the some of the eggs only have one piece of candy if it's a big piece and some too so we're looking you know and you will not believe how fast those 10,000 eggs go it's like a it's like a human vacuum cleaner but if you would be praying because it's a night before Easter and we want to, of course, invite people to come be a part of our worship service on the next day. And we have a large group of people that do not have a church home because they've told us. And so maybe they'll be here at Red Banks come Easter Sunday. So remember, what's next Sunday, folks? Easter. Easter. We're in Holy Week. What was Jesus doing tonight? Right before Monday, Thursday. Y'all know what Monday, Thursday is, don't you? That's kind of a Catholic term. But um, there's different speculations about Wednesday. There was a, some think it was a silent Wednesday. He rested and before Thursday or spent some time with the disciples. Then we move into Thursday and then, of course, Friday. Uh, Thursday night, the garden and uh, Last Supper. And then Friday's the crucifixion. And Sunday, the resurrection. Okay. And we will discuss that at Easter Jam. And it, uh, it's going to be an awesome experience there tonight. And if we invite you to come. It's going to be, uh, we'll start doing hot dogs around 6, 6.30. And just as people show up, we'll let them start eating. And uh, we start the presentation at 6.45. It'll last too dark until it's good and dark. And all the eggs will be out there glowing in the dark. And we've tested that. And it's awesome. And we're going to turn the kids loose. And I'm anxious to see. Last year we had the egg hunt. We had 10,000 eggs. And they were literally picked up in 10 minutes. It was un unreal. I'm hoping that the darkness slows them down a little bit. But I don't think it will. We'll see. Hope you all doing well. The prayer sheets are in the back, and also the listening sheets are in the back. And we are ready to start. We're ready to roll. And uh, let's pray as we start. Lord, I thank you for what this week means to each and every person in this room. I thank you, Father, for Holy Week. And, uh, Lord, how you had that very week planned centuries and your plan is a perfect plan and you have a perfect plan for each of us and we don't want to miss the mark we want to be able to fulfill the purpose that you've called us to so tonight as we Lord look at your sermon on the mount I pray that your spirit would be our teacher and that Lord uh, you would get us on the same page with your word we pray for the glory of Jesus amen all right, tonight is a <clears throat> topic I don't like discussing. 
but we're going to discuss it. Matthew chapter 5, verse 31, Jesus is now going to give us his teaching on divorce. It says, you have heard the law that says a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. But I say that a man who divorces his wife unless she has been unfaithful causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. Now, that's the simple two sentences. Now, lest you think that's the only teaching that Jesus gave on the subject of divorce you're going to find out tonight, that's not the case. He covers this subject in other places um, in the Gospels, and it's covered in, you know, throughout the Scriptures. So we're going to try to get a handle on this. This is a subject, divorce, Jesus' teaching on divorce, that teachers tend, uh, teachers, preachers tend to avoid. Any, anybody got any theories on why? <laughs> Afraid they're going to offend somebody, right? Well, uh, I can understand that, but I'm not afraid of offending anybody uh, because the scriptures speak for themselves. And we can't shy away from any of the scripture, and certainly not even this scripture. And I'm not, and certainly, look, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to offend anybody tonight. That's not my intention. That's not my purpose. And all that, I hope to end with a message of hope and healing that the, that the Lord is, is all about. But I think it's very clear that we understand what Jesus' teaching on divorce is. Why do we need to be clear and understanding on what his teaching on divorce is? Because he taught about it. Because it's in the scripture. And I was talking to someone today at lunch and about an incident that took place in the church not too far from here. And it's absolutely, totally ridiculous kind of what I was hearing because I'm going, have they not read the scriptures? How many times has Jesus said, by the way, have you not read the scriptures? That's one of our biggest problems about any controversial subject is we really haven't read the scriptures and we haven't really understood the scriptures and most of people's theology is built not on what the scriptures say but on what they have experienced in their churches or in their thinking and whatever in times past or their traditions they grew up in or what somebody else said about something but I want to challenge you and I don't want you to take my word for what I'm going to say tonight I hope, if anything, what this is is a, 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 a catapult, a, a catalyst to say to you, go home and you come to uh, your own uh, position about what Jesus is saying about this very subject. That being said, let me tell you another reason this is a very important subject and preachers should not tend to avoid this. I bet I could ask right now how many of you in this room has your life been touched by divorce? Every single one of you would raise your hand. Okay? I'm not asking you to do it. <laughs> and, you know, that's another reason we should not avoid the issue. It's because every single one of us in this room know what pain that brings, what hurt. And we want to be a place of healing. And, you know, we don't want to just, uh, and, and sad to say, in many instances, this has become an issue that we've bashed people over the head with. And that's sad. Because our Lord Jesus is certainly not that way. And I think we'll see that as we get to his teaching tonight. So a lot of preachers, they'll tend to avoid the issue because it's controversial or because they're afraid of offending people. Um, and so they just don't bring it up. And... We're going to bring it up because it's, you know, when have y'all have y'all know, noticed we're just walking methodically verse by verse through the Gospels, and we're here at this section. So if you're here tonight and you think, oh, the Lord, the, the preacher knew I was there and he's picking on me. No, I'm not. I had no idea you was going to be here. Okay, I'm just going verse by verse through the Scriptures because I've had people say, preacher, you you preach that just because I was here. I don't like doing that. So I want to be healing tonight. Healing, healing tonight. We need to remember the context of our Lord's teaching in this particular sermon. We've already discussed this, but I'm going to quiz you on this, okay? 
Basically, what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount is, number one, he's trying to do what? He's trying to teach his disciples because he says he called his disciples to him about matters of the kingdom, but particularly when it comes to law, what's he trying to teach them? What it really says. Why was he having to teach them what it really He says, I didn't come to abolish the law. I didn't come to abolish the law of the prophets or even to change them. What did he come to do? He said, I came to fulfill them. And then in the course of what we've been learning, what had happened to the law? It had been perverted and corrupted. By whom? Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees had corrupted, perverted the law and the teachings of the law. That being said, is it possible that religious leaders and teachers and denominations and churches today can pervert Jesus' teachings on divorce? Yes, yeah, so we need to be very careful how we handle this. Because we don't want to be guilty of the same things that the Pharisees, the Sadducees were guilty of in that day and that time. Okay, remember, what's the key word here? Context, and GGG talks about that in Genesis all the time, don't you? What's your favorite saying, pretext, context, uh, retext? Uh, uh, that, see what I'm talking about? <laughs> uh, say that again. Text without context is a pretext usually for error. You've got to put everything in its context. You can't just pull one or two verses out of the Sermon on the Mount and build a whole doctrine on it. You've also got to look at what else Jesus said in other places about divorce. You've got to put everything in the context of the entire scriptures. So, you know, a lot of times we'll read the Bible and we come, oh, I love that verse, you know, and we'll build our own mind about what that verse is really saying. And then you look somewhere else and it's, and, and there's further clarification, and it'll show you that, hey, what you were thinking about that one verse is not really what was being said. So you've got to put everything within its context. And to do that, you can't be a casual reader of the Scriptures. You've got to be a student of the Scriptures. You've got to read. You've got to study on your own and see everything within its context. So, you can, so as the old song used to say, I can see clearly now. The rain has gone. The fog has gone. Jesus did not come to change the law. We just discussed that. I want you to observe three things tonight in what we're trying to teach here. First, what Moses taught. We're going to talk about what Moses taught about divorce. Okay? Second thing is then we're going to talk about what the Pharisees were teaching. We're going to talk about what the Pharisees were teaching. And then the third thing, in order to understand everything in its context, we're going to see what Jesus is teaching. <clears throat> Notice what present tense of the verb that I use about Jesus. Why? Because his spirit's still teaching on this subject. And he's alive and well. The Pharisees are dead and gone. Moses, you know, well, he's up yonder. Jesus is alive and well. His spirit is present in his church. And his teaching on this, because he taught it, we need to teach it. <clears throat> so these are these three things. Let's look at the original law in relation to divorce. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1 through 4. This is pretty interesting. <clears throat> Suppose a man marries a woman, but she does not please him. Don't you glad we don't have that problem anymore? Having discovered something wrong with her, he writes a document of divorce, hands it to her, and sends her away from his house. And when she leaves his house, she is free to marry another man. But if the second husband also turns against her, writes a document of divorce, hands it to her, and sends her away, and then the, he dies, the first husband may not marry her again, for she has been what? Has been defiled. Now, I'm not going to go in all of that. That's like what I told you earlier, that I want this teaching to be a catapult for you, and I want it to be something that you go in and you read Deuteronomy, you read all these passages with regards to this, but 
for the sake of time, I can't go into all of that, or, and I would probably bore you. This is one of the original teachings on divorce. And notice it says, if the husband finds something wrong with the wife, isn't that kind of chauvinistic? This is problem number one in our particular culture today. In our culture today, we don't think like the culture of that day. And you've got to put yourself in the context of that culture. Okay? In that culture, women do not have the, have not risen to the place of prominence that what you have in this day and time. And I was talking to someone today at lunch. I can't remember who it was. I said, y'all realize that Jesus did more than anyone on the face of this planet on elevating the status of women. Jesus did. Because he's trying to correct what the world has done. When God created Adam and Eve, he, did he love them both? And he created them to, um, uh, GGG did a good job on teaching this not too long ago. When God created them, he created them to be what? Equal in love, equal in, in, in everything. They just had different roles and different responsibilities within the home. But what corrupted it? Sin. And one of the biggest things, and he did a wonderful job teaching it on that Sunday night, one of the worst things that sin did is it came into a, a situation in which the marriage in which the two become literally one, and they were to be one, and de literally destroyed that relationship. And ever since, man and woman have been at a struggle. Have y'all noticed that we are at a, man and woman have been at a struggle with one another? The way we think, the way we do. And sin has brought that into this world. It's what has corrupted us. Remember, the root of sin is selfishness. Now, can you imagine? And if you don't think that that's not the issue, look at, uh, look at a typical marriage. Let me, you know, some of you have been married before. You know, what is it that gets couples in trouble? Selfishness. If you had a husband whose sole desire was to honor and cherish and please his wife, and you had a wife whose sole desire was to honor and please and cherish her husband, what kind of marriage is that going to be? And they live selflessly with one another. You'd say, that is a perfect marriage. But then they'd say, but, but, but preacher, that's, a, that's not living in the real world. See, that's your problem. Is you look at everything in the context of the real world. And Jesus is calling us to, to, to live in accordance to a standard of another world. He says, you are aliens and strangers to this earth. Now that we've been born again, we no longer belong here. We belong to a, a different way of thinking. We belong to a different kingdom. And you've got to put yourself now in the context. Moses is living in a time in which the world has become tremendously corrupted. Marriages are a joke. The way God intended for uh, husbands and wives to relate to one another has become a farce. Now, don't you guys, we don't have that problem anymore. We're modern. And we no longer have those issues, do we? Hmm. We can't even decide what gender ought to marry what gender. The old Mosaic dispensation did not mention what? Didn't even mention it. Isn't that interesting? It just says if man decides a woman doesn't please him, give her a bill of divorcement, and let it be over with, and let it be done with. And then they gave out the, it, the only thing it mentions and says is if she, he dies, that if she's not to go back and marry that man or, she, or, or that will defile her. There's no mention of adultery. Not even mentioned in the Old Testament in, in the, uh, the Deuteron Deuteronomy law there. Why? Hmm. 
it's going to get your attention. Because if you committed adultery in that day, you were stoned to death. So it was not an issue. That's why it wasn't even brought up. They'd stone you. Boy. In this day and age, I'd move somewhere. You couldn't find no rocks anywhere. <laughs> Desert somewhere where they didn't have no rocks. The whole object of the Mosaic legislation was to control divorce. It was rampant for the frivolous of reasons. And so the purpose of the Mosaic legislation, Moses was attempting to control divorce by making them do what? Not do it just for any old reason. He said you had to, had to hand them a what? A bill of divorcement, he said. It came more of a legal transaction. Now, there are three mosaic principles. And when I say mosaic principles, I mean relating to how the mosaic law interprets this. Moses desired to limit divorce. That was his goal. He wanted to limit divorce. And remember... What kind of people Moses was dealing with? Now, that's his people when I say that he's dealing with. That's not even referring to the Gentiles. You know, I'm talking about the Hebrew people. What kind of people was he dealing with with the Hebrew people? Not the pagans, but the Hebrew people. They, they get delivered out of Egypt. They're on their way to the promised land. And um, on the way to the promised land, everything's hunky-dory. You know, there was no fussing, fighting, feuding, complaining, grumbling. Read numbers. That's all they did. Whine, whine, whine. To the point, Moses was fed up. You know, he came down from the mountain, and the very law that had been given to him, he heard sound of uh, laughter in the camp, and come to find out they were having a big orgy, and they were having, had built a golden calf. And what does Moses do with the law? Throws it down. And more than once, he called the Hebrew people. This is the people he's dealing with now. This is his people. He said, you are a what? I heard somebody say it. You are a stiff-necked people. Now, what does that mean? What if somebody calls you stiff-necked? Does that mean that you slept wrong on your pillow and got a crook in your, uh, what do you call that, a, a crick in your neck? Is that what stiff-necked means? What? Yes, it means they were opinionated, they were headstrong, they were stubborn like a mule. That's what he meant. In other words, it was going to be their way or what? Or the highway. That's how he described the people, the Hebrew people. Now, this is important in relation to this. Because you know what one of the biggest problems in marriages is? Selfishness. Wanting it your way. That's the root of it. Most of the problems, that's most of the issues, that's it. No sacrifice for one another. No care for one another. And, and, and so it had gotten out of hand. And so Moses is attempting to limit divorce. Second, he required them to do a written bill of divorcement. In other words, you know, there was a time they could go, I divorced thee, I divorced thee, I divorced thee, just an oral thing, and you got, you'd done and. Moses said, no, we got papyrus now. <laughs> remember? Moses, remember, he, he wrote the Pentateuch all the way from Genesis. I taught, remember that lesson I taught to you all about the clay tablets that I believe was passed down from generation to generation to generation and was kept, uh, the columns. And then when, and I don't think it's by accident, Moses ends up to be in the place where they had the birthplace of papyrus. So he was uh, schooled and how to write and how to write on papyrus, and God 
one of the tremendous things about Moses that we don't often think about is he actually wrote the first five books. He, he, I, well, I think he compiled them because I honestly believe that Genesis was passed down through the years and protected. And it came into Moses, and Moses took them, and then he transcribed them onto papyrus and gave to us the first five books of the Bible. And um, that's you know something we don't often give him credit for. But his whole purpose is to communicate the truth of God to his people, but they wouldn't receive it because um, of their selfishness and stiff neckedness. Stiff neckedness. Stiff. I don't like that nakedness. Uh, yeah, let's move on. And then the third thing in this principle is they were not allowed to marry the same person again. You know, walking in one relationship, out of another, and you say, well, you know, we'll, maybe we'll, we'll get more in detail on that. Because his goal was marriage was not to be something that you just walk in and out of at will. He was trying to teach them that it's seriousness. You just don't walk in and out of it at will. But now the Pharisees, now we're going to move from Moses' teaching to what the Pharisees were doing. So most of the Mosaic legislation was done simply to try to limit divorce because the people had become so stiff-necked because of their sinfulness. And Moses was trying to limit the effect that it was having on uh, marriages and on couples, which, of course, affects the children and the grandchildren and the families. Now, the Pharisees urged, literally urged a man to divorce under certain conditions. In Matthew 19, the Pharisees state, Moses commanded divorce. Now, this is where they really get off on a tangent. This is why the Pharisees were in error. Because in Matthew 19, the Pharisees literally state, it's right there, it's in the scriptures. Moses commanded divorce. Nowhere... In the Old Testament, did Moses command divorce? What was his goal? To limit it. He never commanded people to divorce. Matter of fact, I had a mom one time years ago came to me and said, you know, my kid, I, I preach, I need you to go talk to my daughter. And I said, her husband, I mean, he, he, he's just the scum of the earth. And I think that was literally the words <laughs> that she used. And said, oh, I, you, you just need to go. You need to tell her she needs, she's got to get a divorce. In other words, she was wanting me to command her to get a divorce. Now, let me tell you, I try to teach people when, uh, you know, when they come to me and they talk about it. And I teach them. I try to teach them kind of what I'm doing tonight. I try to teach them about divorce. But you will never hear me say, you need to divorce. I'll never command anyone to divorce. Not that I even have that. I don't even, first of all, I don't have that authority. And, and, and we're wrong to do that. I do not suggest that. And I'm not saying that there's not a time that people should get divorced. We're, we're going to get to that in just a few moments. But that's not my role. And, and it's really not your role. That is a spiritual decision that has to be made by the person that's going to have to seek that divorce. Moses never commanded divorce, but look at what the Pharisees said in Matthew 19, 7. Why then, they asked, they were trying to trap Jesus on matters of the law, and they asked him a question about divorce. Why then, they asked, did Moses do what? He didn't command that people give a, a, a certificate of divorce and send her away. He, he ne they had perverted it to say. They misinterpreted it. The fact that he required, there's a difference in requiring a bill of, of divorcement and commanding someone to be divorced. But that's how they misinterpreted the scripture. Jesus said for one reason. Now here's Jesus' teaching. We looked at Moses, we looked at the Pharisees. You know, they were kind of, they liked their little role and, um, you know, they would tell people, you know, and they love the fact when people get caught in adultery because they got to be participating in what? A stoning. 
Jesus said there's one reason and one reason alone, and that's fornication. Now, what is fornication? We define it as sex before marriage, which it, that's, it is that, the sex before marriage, but it's sex outside the context of marriage. That would be sexual immorality as well, and also would include adultery. Most of the time, Paul is trying to correct in a lot of the epistles, uh, in his writings, in his letters, he's trying to correct a lot of sexual immorality, that, particularly in Corinth, that was going on within the church. Jesus said there's only one reason. We call it the exception clause. If you marry a divorced person, Jesus teaches, then you do what? You commit adultery. But the big thing is, if the reason that a person... Uh, remember Jesus was confronted and he said, Lord, all right, let's say this woman marries this man and he dies and then a woman marries another man and he dies and the woman marries another man and he dies when he gets to heaven who's the husband of this woman and what does he say yeah and all God's people said what amen we'll be brothers and sisters in Jesus now I, I personally happen to believe that I'm going to know Melissa. But we're not going to be in a, a marriage relationship like we are here on this earth. Why did God create marriage to begin with? For companionship, so they could complete one another. Now, if you notice it, God made a woman different than a man and a man different than a woman, and he wanted them to be made so that they might be complete in one another and to enjoy life together and to love one another and he when he created them he created them he said it's going to be one man for one woman for what for a lifetime that is god's ultimate intention to that but fornication and adultery and other sexual sins crept in and destroyed that that's why the bible is so uh, uh, adamant about sexual sins. If you don't believe it, read it. I mean, it's. I mean, it's some of the harshest language is reserved for the, for that. Jesus is emphasizing the sanctity of marriage. He took it seriously. Read everything he teaches on on marriage. Or divorce, and you will see he, his intention is to teach that the marriage is sacred. And I want to tell you, I, you know, I've been in the ministry forty something years, and let me tell you, I do the best I can do. I have been to a lot of weddings and done a lot of things, and you know, perform weddings and everything. And let me tell you, there are some people that do not take marriage seriously. That was a lot of people. Could not believe this. I did a wedding one time. You know, did the counseling and everything. And I, you know, we had concerns and everything. And but you know, you can't. There's no one can <laughs> go. You ought not get married. They got married. Seven days later, I get a call. And they're no longer together. They were gone within seven days. Within one week. It was like, uh, I've met, I, you know, and I, I don't know how to say, say this, but I think that the girl was more in love with a wedding than she was um, the marriage. Want to have a wedding. It's weird. Marriage is sacred because God has made it sacred. It's where the two become one. Marriage is not a legal transaction. Marriage is a spiritual union. That's what marriage is. Y'all remember the Sunday I had, I don't remember who it was that came up here, and I was kind of teaching about what sexual immorality does, and I brought one of the guys up here, I think, and I put a Band-Aid. I said, you know, every time you have 
sexual relations with you know, a girl, you know what happens? It's like this band-aid. It's a, it's a spiritual union. There's something deeper about that sexual relationships than just a physical act. It's a spiritual act as well. And then you tie your heart with that person or that heart person ties their heart with you. And how many times have you seen, you know, the guy's uh, not really interested in the girl, but the girl's just deeply in love with the guy. And that just deepens every time you have that relationship. And then it's broken, and it's just like the Band-Aid ripped off. And remember, I put the Band-Aid back on. And how many times did it take before the Band-Aid wouldn't even stick anymore? It wasn't that long. And that was to emphasize the fact that marriage is a spiritual union. And, you, and, the more, and when you try to... to uh, the more people you include, this is why this weird world we lived in, you know, of having more than one wife or more than one husband, what do they call that? Um, polygamy, yeah, it's just weird. And it's not in the teachings of scriptures, by the way. I know our uh, real fundamentalist Mormon folk teach that, but I, that's, I don't know where they get that. I know with Solomon wives and everything, but that was not the way God intended. It is very clear from what Jesus taught and it's also very clear from what Genesis taught that this union was always, as symbolized with Adam and Eve, was always to be with one man for one woman for what? For a lifetime. Because it's a spiritual union. So then why did Moses allow divorce? Number one, because he says what? Jesus said this in, uh, elsewhere in the Gospels. He said the reason Moses allowed you to do it is because of what? hardness of your hearts the hardness of your hearts John 19 8 Jesus replied Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were what hard but it was not this way from the beginning right out of Jesus mouth now see men back then were the big big men on campus you know it wasn't so much the women and the equality the stuff that's come in and now but now you could almost say he could you could almost flip this and say Moses permitted you to divorce your husbands because your hearts were hard because now a lot of women initiate it and a lot of women cheat on their husbands and vice versa You got to prove of that? Because what he wants in a relationship is what? He wants a relationship built on what? Trust and love and, and selflessness and sacrifice. Because that's who he is. But that's not where we are. And why? What's the root of that? What's the root of that? Sin and selfishness. God has never commanded people to divorce. Never. We must get rid of the legalistic approach on this. Now, let me show you. Uh, you know, somebody says, well, he, she has ruined my life, so I must get rid of them. Contrast that to, uh, you know, that he gives one legitimate reason for divorce and that's fornication and it's as if God understood that Jesus understood that because see once uh, and we I've been taught and I and I and this holds true I had a couple one time I was shocked by it they taught a Sunday school class and one day I got a phone call and I answered it Melissa this is back before cell phones by the way Melissa standing in the kitchen. I answered the phone call, and it was just bawling and screaming in the phone. And I had so much so I had to pull it away like this. And uh, I, I finally got the person to calm down. I figured out it was a woman. And please come over. Please come over. He's leaving me. He's leaving me. 
well, I told Melissa, and she said, well, I said, what do I do? She said, well, go over there. He was there. The husband was there. So I go over there, open up the door. He opens up the door, and he goes, she called you? You know, and so I go in the living room, and this has happened, by the way, about three times. I don't know why they feel like they ought to call the preacher, like I'm some magic worker, just sprinkle some dust. And all the problems in your marriage that have accumulated for, what, years, and all of a sudden have come to a head, and I'm supposed to sprinkle magic dust, say a prayer, and it's all going to be fixed. Sit down. And this is back when I would do a little marriage counseling. I don't do any marriage counseling anymore because I'm called to be a pastor, a preacher, an authority in his word. And I found that counseling just sucks up a lot of time. So I recommend now people to, be, to go to the professionals. That's why I don't marriage counsel. And lest you know this, I told the church this before I came here. Told the, and it's also even for my protection because there's how many pastors of you know of has fallen because they do marriage counseling? So, um, I was going to you know, do, try to do a little marriage counseling. Got them set to my church office. I said, come into my church office. And they came into my church office, and they sat down. And I looked at him dead in the eye, and I said, are you having an affair? Just point blank. I want to hear what he said. You know what he said? No. She goes, I think he is. He's been cold and distant lately. I, I, he just ain't acting right. You know, I just think he is. I said, look at me and be truthful. Be honest. You're supposed to be honest. Are you having an affair? Oh, no, 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 no. Time rocks along. I'm not going to tell you how long. They end up getting a divorce. Guess what we find out? He was having an affair. Lied, you know, just lied. And I, I could tell you some, so many, so many stories about this. And what's sad is the pain, the hurt, the heartache. The one child being involved. Had to go testify in court in Texas in a child custody battle one time. Never seen anything as brutal as that was and the infidelity what brought that marriage this was a man who was I'm, he was completely faithful to his wife but his wife was completely unfaithful to him having an affair with someone who was higher up in a federal office and it was brutal and it's tearing us up now, here's the interesting thing. If you read Paul's writing to the Corinthians to straighten things out, and I wanted to bring this up to you tonight because I think it, you'll understand more about Jesus' teaching on it in looking at how Paul interpreted Jesus' teaching. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul presents is presented with this question, what if a woman... See, Paul would go into a synagogue, preach the gospel, and what would happen? People would get saved. But every now and then, a woman would get saved, but the husband would not. Okay? So, the woman is wondering, well, what do I do? My husband's a what? He's a pagan. And pagans act like what? Pagans. And so, she, so they bring this matter up to Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 and says... Shouldn't the woman leave the husband who's an unbeliever? What does Paul command the wife to do? Stay. Stay. Now, this is why I wanted to bring that up. Why did Paul, you know, you think, well, yeah, he's a pagan. He acts like a pagan. You know, I could see church people. You know, you, you just need to get rid of him and go find you a good Christian guy on Christian.com. No. Paul said, 
stay with the unbelieving husband with the goal of what? That by your love, your commitment, your satisfaction, your dedication, and your selflessness, you might what? Win him to Christ. Now let me ask you this question. Why do you, Paul, think gave you that advice? Because he understood Jesus' teaching on divorce. In his teaching on divorce, Jesus understood the significance of the sanctity of, of marriage. Okay, so Paul gives us a pretty good perspective of that. You know, you think a Christian woman married to a pagan man has ample reason to leave him? Well, I've met some encounters like that, but I've seen some wonderful women. I, matter of fact, one lady I know, she's dead now did exactly what 1 Corinthians 7 told her to, and lo and behold, her husband was saved. I mean, he was a round, I mean, and some women, I mean, you know, I don't know what women can put up with. I mean, women can put up with a lot. And how, you know, how many times they get cheated on or whatever, but you know, just because your husband cheats on you or your wife cheats, you know, is that a reason just to go down and just, oh, that's over, it's over. You know, where does forgiveness come? Where does reconciliation come? You may have every right to divorce because of what Jesus said, but does that necessarily mean you should? Sometimes, though, uh, you know, I've had this happen before. I, I'll have a woman come in. She's black and blue. She's been beaten. And I tell her, you know, what the first thing I do is tell her? Get out of the house. You don't deserve that. If you're going to act that way, you ought to call the law. That's what I tell them. Holiness begins where? At home. People wonder what the problems in our society are today. They want to blame the Democrats, the Republicans. They want to blame everything. Let me tell you where the problem is. The problem is what's happening in our home. It starts at home. I don't care how evil the world is. If your home is right with God and your home is a place where holiness is, it's a great place. I'm not saying the home is going to be without problems. I, that's not it. I'm just saying that when you're in a holy home, a, a home that's set apart to God, it's a home that deals with their problems the right way because they take them to the Word of God through prayer, through Bible study, and through a commitment to one another that they're under a higher authority than themselves. That's what the commitment needs to be. Divorce, though, I want you to understand, is not an unpardonable sin, even though some people in the church have made it into that. Divorce is not an unpardonable sin. There's only one unpardonable sin according to Scripture, and that's what? Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And it's ridiculous that we've made this into an unpardonable sin. I mean, it's almost like there was a time that divorced people were treated like second-class citizens in the kingdom of heaven. And it should not be. It is an issue. I had a, you know, what, why, according to Jesus, what is the only reason for divorce? Fornication with, or adultery, cheating. I had a, there was a fact, I had a Sunday school teacher. And matter of fact, in that teaching, and you can read it closely, it's as if, all right, if, if a man and a woman is married and the husband dies, does, does the wife have permission to remarry? Yes. It's as if the man, I won't say never existed, it's just, it's as if she has the, according to God, she can, nothing wrong with her remarrying. You know, the same legal or, or the same emphasis would put, if a woman, let's say, was caught in adultery, the man could divorce the woman, and he'd be free to remarry as well. It's like a death. And some of, I've heard people even say divorce is like a what? It's like a death. 
But when adultery is there, they are free to remarry. Yet, boy, today, oh, good Lord. Um, I had a, like I was trying to tell you, I had a Sunday school teacher who was a godly man. He found out one day his wife had been cheating on him. She was in love with this other man and left him. Filed for divorce. He fought as long as he could, but anyway, he ended up divorced, and he was still our Sunday school teacher. One of the finest, godliest men I've ever known. Well, according to the scriptures, according to what Jesus taught, he is free to do what? Remarry. But the church treated him like he was a second-class citizen. Even though he had every grounds to divorce, and when he remarried and his name came up for uh, to be uh, ordained as a deacon, to be elected as a deacon, he got elected as a deacon, but then it came about his ordination, and man, people were fighting it like crazy. And he was literally, he was ordained with us because the church took a vote on him and everything, but it was a contentious thing. Some people even left the church. And it's because they didn't have a tremendous, they did not have an understanding of what the scripture said. I mean, there were people there who knew. He'd, he'd grown up, he, he lived in this church, and that knew everything that had happened. And he was a completely innocent party, and according to Jesus' teaching, had every right for the divorce. But yet, we're going to rob him. Because we don't look at all the scriptures. Divorce is not an unpardonable sin, but I want you to understand it is a serious sin if it's done not according to the scriptures. Let me tell you why. Malachi 2.16, God says, for I what? <laughs> he hates it. Why do you think God hates divorce? Why do you think he hates divorce? It breaks, first of all, it breaks his heart. Why does it break his heart? Let me ask you this. When your kids mess up, does it break your heart? It, it breaks your heart. When you see your kids fighting, does it break your heart? Do you think that when we fight as husbands and wives, as spouses, or even as church members for that matter, do you think it breaks God's heart? When there's such a, a, a friction in relationships, it breaks God's heart, and he hates divorce. He hates divorce not only because of how you treat one another, but he hates divorce and how it affects. You think divorce affects children? Let me tell you, I've heard someone say one time, look, you know, let me just tell you, our, you know, divorce doesn't really uh, affect you know, children like what they say it does. That's a bold-faced lie. I've worked with children for 40-something years. I have heard them cry. I have heard them plead. Uh, you know, please don't leave my mama. Please don't leave my mama. I have heard it and heard it and heard it. And if you think, and they said, well, yeah, you know, I heard one guy one time said, yeah, but it's better for us to get a divorce than for them to have to hear me beating on her all the time. I had a guy tell me that one time. Well, yeah, I imagine so. And I would like to tell you, I, I wish I could tell you what I felt like doing to him. world we live in but you think that uh, divorce doesn't affect you wonder why God hates divorce I'll tell you why he hates divorce because every tear a child sheds over divorce the, the Bible tells us he puts those tears in a bottle and there's going to be justice for those tears every man every masochistic sadistic man that thinks he's so Mr. Macho and, uh, and, you know, that he feels like he has the authority to beat his wife into submission and she cries and she moans and she's bruised and she has to call the police and, and, and bring them into their home. Let me tell you, every one of those tears, God's putting into a bottle and justice is coming. I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. Divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So guard your heart and do not be unfaithful to your wife. 
So to every man, let me tell you, who's a spiritual leader in the home? According to the scriptures, the man. It starts with you, men, and that is that your heart be faithful to your wife. That's where it starts. None of this, well, you know, she's not meeting my needs. Bah humbug. I bet you aren't meeting all her needs, too. Well, she's not meeting my physical needs. Bah humbug. There's no excuse for it. Be faithful to your wife. Malachi chapter 4. I wanted to bring this to you because Malachi is a very interesting chapter. This is very interesting to me. The Lord of Heaven's army says, who's the Lord of Heaven's army? We would say the pre-incarnate Christ here. And Malachi 4 is also... The Sorry about that. Fell off my ear. Everybody okay? You thought the Lord of Heaven's armies was on his way back, didn't you? That's how fast he's coming, though, in the moment and twinkling of an eye. So you better be ready. And justice is coming with him. He came in as a lamb, but he's coming back like a lion. The meek and lowly Jesus everybody likes to talk about. You wait till he comes. He's coming back to give judgment to the nations. And Matthew, Malachi 4 is really, he's looking forward in history to the coming of Jesus, but he's even looking beyond that and making even to the second coming. So he's looking really at both comings. This is a very interesting chapter. The Lord of Heaven's army says, The day of judgment is coming, burning like a furnace. And on that day, the arrogant and the wicked will be burned up like straw, and they will be consumed, roots, branches, and all. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in the wings, and you will go free, leaping with joy like calves let out to pasture. And John's on the back row. He's... He's my resident cow expert. I've never seen a cow leap out to the pasture. John, is that biblical? Does that happen? Yeah, he tells me about how, man, when they've been cooped up and all they've had is hay all year, you know, and all of a sudden the grass starts coming back like the resurrected, you know, the, the springtime and the grass comes back, he says, man, they get excited. On the day when I act, you will tread upon the wicked as they were dust under your feet, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Okay, now this is the last chapter in Malachi, which is the last chapter where? And after this chapter is written, do you know there's not a, another prophetic word for 400 years until Jesus comes? So these are going to be the last words that's even spoken for 400 years. That's older than the America is right now. So do you think what Malachi has to say is going to be pretty important? Because the silence is going to begin for 400 years. So you better hang on these words and look what he says. Remember to obey the law of whom? My servant. All the decrees and regulations that I gave on Mount Sinai for all of Israel. Look, I am sending you to the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. His preaching will turn. And here's what I wanted you to see. His preaching will turn the hearts of the fathers to their what? And the hearts of the children to their fathers. And otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. So the last verse before the prophets grow silent for 400 years until John the Baptist comes and Jesus comes preaching repentance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The last verse. What's it about? The family. And the fathers having their hearts for their children. And the children having a heart for their father. What does that say about the family? What does it say about a father? it begins 
That's why fathers need to turn their hearts towards their home. And if you turn your hearts towards your home, that means you turn your hearts toward your children's mother. You turn your heart toward the wife of your youth. That's why the writer of Ecclesiastes, the wisest man ever lived, said what? Do not delay in fulfilling your vow. And remember the wife of your youth. Be faithful to the wife of your youth. used to have a puppet ministry team called Sin Busters. We traveled all over the country, especially in Mississippi. And I had about 22 teenagers that were in my puppet team. One day, the Lord, I was listening to Focus on the Family, Turn Your Heart Towards Home. It was a song they had come up with. And on that album by Stephen Curtis uh, Chapman, was a song called Daddy Please Find a Reason so I got one of my daughters and they sing like I do Kermit the Frog type singing with my daughters would come up I'd hand them a microphone matter of fact my son did one as well hand them the microphone and he'd begin like this my wife and I used to fight a lot but not anymore since the night my little boy standing at the door he overheard me saying to my wife I can't find a reason to stay and on the way out I kissed him goodbye and that's when I heard my son say daddy please find a reason to stay with my mama we both love you daddy please don't leave if you can't find a reason, Daddy, to stay with my mama, then, Daddy, please let that reason be me. It must have been the Lord that night, speaking through my son, because I can't begin to tell you the great things that God has done. Because from that point on, he realized reason to stay with the mama was his son. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for Jesus' teaching. Thank you, Lord, for Moses, his commitment, his dedication. And though we live in a world that corrupts your word, much like the Pharisees and the Sadducees did, Lord, I thank you that there is a remnant trust your word Lord marriages relationships are built on trust sacrifice loyalty selflessness and the only way we can be that kind of a person Lord is to commit our life fully and completely to you to wake up every morning at the foot of the cross and say Lord not my will but yours be done Lord Help us to, as you challenged us, that we would come after you. And if we're going to come after you, that we deny ourselves, not live for ourselves. That we'd forsake ourselves and pick up that cross daily and follow after you. So, Lord, give us the kind of homes that reflect Jesus. The only way to reflect Jesus in our homes is to know Jesus and to live for him. Thank you for his example. Thank you for his love. For greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends, for his family, for those around him. Thank you for your example, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Y'all have a good week. Uh, at the Easter Jam and the egg hunt and um, if I don't see you I'll see you on Resurrection Sunday praise God for the resurrection amen and if he can raise dead Jesus can he raise a dead marriage yes he can <laughs>